Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Throughout history, there have been those mysterious, misunderstood individuals who have left bafflement, oddities, and enigmas in their wake. They seem to come from nowhere to puzzle and amaze, only to disappear into the depths of history, to be former ciphers beyond our understanding. One such strange individual called New Orleans his home in the early 1900s, and by some accounts was more than merely an eccentric, but also an immortal vampire. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… A young girl disappeared in Yosemite National Park back in 1981. To this day, no one knows where she is, and some say a paranormal cause is to blame. After Lori Erica Ruff's death, her husband discovered he had been married to a complete stranger because Lori Erica Ruff never existed. Was there a plot to murder Marconi scientists in the 1980s? But first, was a New Orleans neighborhood home to an immortal vampire in the early 1900s. We begin there. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. The setting for this odd tale is the city of New Orleans, Louisiana, in the early 1900s, when one day a mysterious stranger came to town to take up residence at an opulent home at 1039 Royal Street. The stranger called himself Jacques Saint Germain and immediately made an indelible impression with his dashing good looks, charming demeanor, and obvious wealth. Indeed, he was known to splash about money as if it were nothing to him, and came to be known for holding lavish parties at his luxurious home where he would entertain high society's rich and elite. It was not long before this stranger was the talk of the town, yet no one really had any idea of where he had come from, nor much about him at all other than that he spoke French, English, and Spanish fluently, and that he was well-traveled talking excitedly of his trips to far-flung places throughout the world, but giving very little personal information about himself. It didn't seem to matter, though, as the handsome socialite was so rich and charming, beguiling even, that people overlooked it. As time went on, Jacques' eccentricities began to come through. He was rarely seen during daylight hours, and it was noticed that during his conversations, he would often slip into talking about events in the far past with such familiarity and with such a sentimental cast to his expression that it gave people the unsettling feeling that he had actually been present at these events, despite them being sometimes centuries in the past. He also began to make bold claims that he was a direct descendant of the late Comte de Saint-Germain, who was a mysterious European adventurer philosopher, and prominent member of high society in the 1700s, as well as a personal friend and diplomat of King Louis XV. This was all taken with a grain of salt, and most took it to be said in jest, merely entertaining banter, but there were others who noticed that Jacques actually did bear a striking resemblance to Comte de Saint-Germain, 
and seemed to behave very much the same as well. Rumors began to swirl, and before long there were whispers that not only was Jacques related to Comte de Saint-Germain, but that they were one and the same. This despite the fact that Comte had died in 1784. Nevertheless, there was speculation that Jacques has somehow achieved immortality, an idea bolstered by the fact that Comte de Saint-Germain always appeared to be around the same age in all of his portraits, about 40, which was incidentally exactly the same age as the mysterious Jacques. On top of all of his other idiosyncrasies and his uncanny resemblance to his claimed ancestor, this led to suspicion that Jacques was perhaps actually an immortal and had merely changed his identity from Comte de Saint-Germain upon moving to New Orleans. This was bolstered by the fact that Comte de Saint-Germain had often made bold claims that he was hundreds of years old and had found an elixir of everlasting life on top of other bold and mysterious proclamations with the famous Italian author, adventurer, and great historical womanizer Casanova himself, once writing of Comte Saint-Germain in his memoir thus. This extraordinary man, intended by nature to be the king of impostors and quacks, would say in an easy, assured manner that he was 300 years old, that he knew the secret of the universal medicine, that he possessed a mastery over nature, that he could melt diamonds, professing himself capable of forming, out of ten or twelve small diamonds, one large one of the finest water without any loss of weight. All this, he said, was a mere trifle to him, notwithstanding his boastings, his barefaced lies, and his manifold eccentricities. I cannot say I thought him offensive. In spite of my knowledge of what he was and in spite of my own feelings, I thought him an astonishing man, as he was always astonishing me. Another oddity that Jacques shared with Comte de Saint-Germain was that although he threw decadent feasts and seemed to revel in people gorging themselves on food in his presence, he never seemed to actually eat anything himself. He was said to merely talk and observe, sometimes drinking from a chalice of wine but never actually eating any of the food on display. This oddly mirrors an unusual observation made of Comte de Saint-Germain by Casanova, who said, the most enjoyable dinner I had was with Madame de Robert Gurgi, who came with the famous adventurer known by the name of the Count de Saint-Germain. This individual, instead of eating, talked from the beginning of the meal to the end, and I followed his example in one respect, as I did not eat, but listened to him with greatest attention. It may safely be said that, as a conversationalist, he was unequaled. All of this led to people half-jokingly suggesting that Jacques was not only immortal and actually Comte de Saint-Germain himself, but possibly even a vampire, although some people seem to have steadily grown to accept this as more than just a joke. Jacques Saint-Germain, of course, got wind of the rumors and seemed to get great amusement from them, enjoying stoking the gossip by neither admitting nor denying anything. It all seemed like a game to him and only served to fuel the fires of the rumors. This might have been where the whole story ended, with Jacques Saint-Germain merely remembered as an eccentric, rich playboy, if it weren't for an odd incident that struck a few months after his coming to New Orleans. One evening, a woman was witnessed to drop to the street from one of Saint-Germain's upper floor windows with onlookers saying she had jumped. The woman, a prostitute, survived the fall but was described as being absolutely terrified by something she had seen in the house. Things got even stranger when she was questioned by police, during which time she claimed that the reason she had jumped was because St. Germain had tried to ferociously bite her neck, causing her to fight him off with all of her might and fly into a panic, jumping out that window to escape. Despite this rather dramatic testimony, St. Germain laughed it off and was a well-respected member of high society by that time, and the police told him that everything could be worked out the following morning. No one thought at all that he could have been guilty of what he was accused of, and it was thought that the woman, a lowly prostitute in their eyes, was on drugs or insane. The authorities explained to him that his coming in for questioning was merely a formality 
and that everything would quickly be sorted out. St. Germain then pleasantly and politely accepted, wished the officers a good evening, and closed the door. It would be the last anyone ever saw of Jacques St. Germain. When the next morning came around, the police patiently waited for St. Germain to arrive, but he never did. Still not thinking him guilty of anything other than a poor choice of prostitutes, they nevertheless went to his residence to see what was going on. The house was found to still hold most of St. Germain's belongings, large amounts of valuables and all of his furniture. The second floor of his residence was supposedly murky and heavily curtained, and as the police pushed into the gloom, they allegedly made a macabre discovery of numerous bottles containing a mixture of wine and human blood. Of the missing St. Germain there was no sign, and he would indeed never be seen again, disappearing into the night to leave raging rumors and all of that blood behind. With this strange and rather grim discovery, coupled with the sudden and mysterious disappearance of Jacques St. Germain, the rumors of immortality and vampires quickly went from a sort of joke to very serious indeed, and the legend took off as those who had looked at these ideas with skepticism suddenly were faced with the realization that something very weird was going on indeed. People were now convinced that not only were Comte de Saint-Germain and Jacques Saint-Germain one and the same, but that he was an actual, real-life vampire. Many things went into such wild reasoning. Why did they look so exactly alike? Indeed, there were also many similarities in both their personas and demeanors. Both were eccentric, rich ladies' men with a penchant for engaging conversation and spinning fantastical yarns, and both were well-learned world travelers. It seemed too much to be a coincidence. Why was he seen almost always in the evening hours, and why was he never seen eating anything at his own luscious feasts? How was it that he knew such details about events hundreds of years before, and why did he speak of these things as if he were there seeing them with his own eyes? Why was he so secretive with his personal information, and most importantly of all, why did he have bottles and bottles of blood in a darkened room? No one had a clue, but it all added up to paint a very odd picture. This theory was further fueled along by the fact that although Comte de Saint-Germain is considered to have been a real person, his actual history is rather murky and ill-defined, making him quite the mysterious figure indeed, ripe for fitting him into all of the madness. Very little is known about the man himself, where he came from, or even when and where he was born, or what his true name really was. This is partly because he changed identities and titles so often, but also because he was a social chameleon and considered to be a very skilled and accomplished liar in all things. One Lady Jemima York once said of him, "'He is an odd creature, and the more I see him the more curious I am to know something about him. He is everything with everybody. He talks ingeniously with Mr. Ray, philosophy with Lord Willoughby, and is gallant with Miss York, Miss Carpenter, and all the young ladies. But the character and philosopher is what he seems to pretend to and to be a good deal conceited of. The others are put on to comply with Les Menaires du Monde, but that you are to suppose his real characteristic, and I can't but fancy he is a great pretender in all kinds of science as well as that he really has acquired an uncommon share in some. Put this all together, and it's very difficult to pin down any concrete information on him at all, making him almost like a literary character rather than a real person, and allowing people in retrospect to make up all kinds of wild tales about him as they see fit. There were also the many accounts of Comte de Saint-Germain being very skilled in many areas of the arts and sciences, far beyond what would be expected from someone having lived only one lifetime, him declaring himself to be hundreds of years old, as well as much testimony that he was an actual alchemist. There are quite a few unverified accounts of him turning metal to gold or creating perfect diamonds from impure ones, 
and even when he was officially alive, there were rumors that he had used these powers to prolong his own life, perhaps indefinitely. Indeed, there were many who claimed that over the years he had not noticeably aged at all. This caused rumors that he had never really died at all, only moving on to take on another identity, perhaps even to New Orleans. Combine this with the enigmatic nature of Jacques Saint-Germain, all of the striking similarities, the mysterious crime, and his subsequent vanishing, as well as the bottles of blood, and you have a perfect storm for the creation of an eerie legend. Now, it's quite possible that Jacques Saint-Germain was just what he seemed to be, merely an odd, rich fellow, nocturnal because of his hard-partying lifestyle, and that he had certain kinks, such as biting women's necks and drinking wine mixed with blood, his freak flag flying high. Maybe he was afraid that he would be arrested, and that was why he skipped town, and his resemblance to Comte de Saint-Germain was just a coincidence. But where's the fun in that? Stories of ancient immortals and vampires are much more interesting, and this has caused the legend to grow. In the end, although it is all a fascinating story, there is little to actually verify or substantiate any of it, which has indeed allowed it to become the pervasive legend it is today. Everything else has been obscured by murky history and countless retellings, making the truth evasive. The only thing we really know for sure is that both of these men were real and that they shared many similarities in both appearance and character. Other than that, we're left to wonder just who Comte de Saint-Germain really was and what connection he had to the mysterious Jacques Saint-Germain, if any. It is probate that this is all merely coincidence and misunderstanding colored by exaggeration, misinterpretation, and myth-making. But what if there really was an ageless vampire who had made his way from the old world to the new to come calling at New Orleans? What if Comte de Saint-Germain really was an immortal, whether because of being a vampire or through some magical elixir of life? What if he is still out there now. Up next, a young girl disappeared in Yosemite National Park back in 1981, and to this day no one knows where she is, and some say a paranormal cause is to blame. After Laura Erica Ruff's death, her husband discovered he'd been married to a complete stranger because Lori Erica Ruff never existed. These stories and more when Weird Darkness returns. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, Jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness Journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, 
My friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Stacey Ann Aris was only 14 years old when she vanished without a trace inside Yosemite National Park in 1981. To this day, her disappearance remains unsolved, though Yosemite National Park has been the site of other people going missing and creepy occurrences, Aris's case is especially eerie given the startling lack of evidence. Due to the mysterious circumstances surrounding the event, some people believe there were supernatural forces at play. And while there is probably a scientific or rational explanation for what happened to Stacy Ann Aris on July 17, 1981, the reality of her departure remains as haunting as any paranormal mystery. Aris was traveling with others when she disappeared. She and her father were with six other people. The group was horseback riding and had reached Sunrise High Sierra Camp before Aris wandered off to take photographs of the nearby lake. The camp was a tourist destination, meaning there were people around to watch Eris as she walked toward the lake. While the group was resting, Eris told her father she wanted to hike down and take pictures of a nearby lake. Her father declined to join her. When Eris left her companions, the tour guide recalled seeing her standing on a rock about 50 yards south of the trail. The trail to the lake was only one and a half miles long. That is the last time anyone has officially reported seeing Eris. When Eris wandered off, a 77-year-old man from her camp group accompanied her. The man sat down to rest while Eris walked ahead. When Eris didn't return, the man got up to look for her, then gathered the remainder of the group to search more extensively. He later reported that he'd spoken with a group of hikers, but they said they hadn't seen her. Witnesses say they saw the man sitting down as Eris wandered off, and there is no further evidence implicating him in any wrongdoing. Despite the search beginning only minutes after Eris vanished, no one found any trace of the 14-year-old girl except for the lens from her camera. It was found inside the grove of trees Eris entered before presumably photographing the lake. Eris reportedly had several other items on her person. She was wearing an ankle bracelet and possibly stud earrings, as well as carrying binoculars and her camera. None of these items ever turned up. One experienced climber noted on a forum that if Eris had lost her lens cap, it shouldn't necessarily be considered a sign of foul play, since the caps are easy to lose. Eris's group began searching for the girl not long after she disappeared, and rescue crews invested extensive efforts to find her it's all the more bizarre that she has not been found. By some reports, up to 150 people looked for the teen, which included roughly 67 Mountain Rescue Association volunteers, dogs, and helicopters, all canvassing a three to five square mile area around Sunrise Lake. Despite this, the camera lens is the only clue. According to a news article from the Fresno Bee in 1981, the dogs employed in the search were unable to pick up any scent because of dry and dusty conditions. On a forum dedicated to discussions about unresolved mysteries, Redditor Hector Abaya shared an anecdote about how the elements in the wilderness – that is, wind, trees, and canyons – can affect a person's sense of hearing. She left the group and was exploring alone, off-trail, which is very dangerous if you're not carrying navigation tools and experienced in using them. She was also likely distracted, paying more attention to photography than to navigation. The search was fairly small relative to the size of the area they had to work with, and it's likely she kept moving even once she realized she was lost, because the majority of people do. But it's also the absolute worst thing to do in almost every case, because then searchers are playing catch-up. The point I see brought up fairly often is that she was within shouting distance, but I don't think there's a way to prove that. Sound in the wilderness is weird. I've spent a ton of time hiding from searchers as a training subject, and even I'm still sometimes surprised at how variable sound can be. 
I've had researchers shouting for me from maybe 50 feet away, and I couldn't hear because of a slight ridge and wind blowing away from me. On the other hand, I've been freaked out by hearing a dog panting and human voices just above me when I knew the team wasn't close to me yet, because I was hiding on the edge of a canyon and there was a weird magnifying echo effect. Usually the trend is for sound to be dampened, though. Even a bit of vegetation, a small hill and a slight breeze you barely notice are enough to muffle sound to a surprising degree. Search and rescue volunteers and outdoor enthusiasts who have researched Eris's case seem to agree that some reports were possibly inaccurate in the first place. On a forum about unresolved mysteries, Redditor Persimmon Pluot, who claims to have grown up and worked in Yosemite, said, "...the official description of where she went missing makes no sense. Purportedly, the group arrived at the Sunrise HSC where they planned to stay in some of the cabins." We're told Stacy left to photograph the lake, which was inside of the cabins. There is no lake in sight of the camp. It would have been a very long hike to reach a lake, so that discrepancy is odd. That fact changes things a lot. If she really set out to photograph the lake, then there was a lot of distance and space that could have accounted for her disappearance. There are many crevices and spots where she could have possibly fallen, and crevices can conceal anything. However, not knowing where she went makes it difficult to guess. From the same forum, Redditor Hector Abaya, who says they are a search and rescue volunteer, rebutted this, saying, "...even articles from normally reputable sources get a lot of details wrong in many wilderness disappearance cases, from what I've seen. I think it's just because the reporters likely don't have a frame of reference and it's just a quick blip, not a Pulitzer contender, so they skimp on the research." but sometimes it can be shockingly inaccurate. And it isn't even just on the reporters, because usually the information comes from a police spokesman who has little to no direct involvement with the investigation, and that information was relayed to the spokesman by the OIC on scene, and the OIC on scene likely got it from Volunteer IC, and the Volunteer IC likely got it from field researchers. It's like the telephone game. I'm frankly amazed that they get it right as often as they do. Eris is one of many people who disappeared in a national park, though the exact number is unknown. The National Park Service doesn't keep a record of the many people who have vanished in their parks. In response to a Freedom of Information Act request regarding the number of park disappearances, an official said, "...please know that we reach out to and collaborated with other offices and bureaus, the Office of Law Enforcement and Security, BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, and NPS, National Park Service." According to the feedback we received, they do not track or maintain listings of missing persons. David Paulides, Bigfoot enthusiast, investigator, author, and documentarian, has posited through his Missing 411 series that there are similarities between national park disappearance cases. Paulides claims he has spent 7,000 hours investigating the park system disappearances. From his research, He estimates there are around 1,600 missing persons across 85 million acres of parkland in the United States. Paulides often chooses cases that might fit certain paranormal theories, most of which include Bigfoot. He arranges the disappearances he researches into what he calls clusters, cases with similar circumstances. One of the criteria for these clusters is storms. In Eris's case, search and rescue dogs struggled to pick up her scent since the conditions were oddly dry and windy. According to a news article published in the Fresno Bee around the time of Eris's disappearance, park officials said Stacy was having some family or school troubles and she was missing her teenage boyfriend. It's speculated that perhaps the teen ran away or had simply embarked on a walk into the woods. However, National Park's spokeswoman Linda Abbott countered that Eris would not have gone for a walk since the teen wasn't wearing suitable shoes. The last conversation Eris had with her father was about her shoes. He thought she should change into her hiking boots, but she walked off in a pair of flip-flops instead. Yosemite is known for its large population of black bears. There are between 300 and 500 bears in the park alone. As the national park is a popular place to hike, visitors are to remain at least 50 yards from any bears they encounter in undeveloped areas. Though these statistics evoke a small probability that Eris encountered one of these animals on her trip to the lake, 
it's unlikely that they would have confronted her, considering the National Park Service claims no one in Yosemite has perished from an encounter with a black bear. One of the common themes David Politis includes in his clusters is drowning. Over the last decade, this has remained the top incident to result in the loss of life in the national parks. Since Eris vanished while taking photographs of a lake, it is possible she slipped into the water. Search and Rescue, however, sent in divers and spent time walking search dogs around the lake, but they came back with nothing. There is little evidence to suggest that a person is responsible for Eris's disappearance, but some still speculate that this may be the case. Moreover, investigators have not ruled out the possibility of something nefarious. Redditor Quarantinia shared their thoughts on a forum about unresolved mysteries. Is it at all possible and or likely that she did not get lost and wander around for a while, unable to hear anyone call her or too far away to be heard, but someone who knows the park better than her approaches her to help but is actually a deranged person or something along those lines? I'm fairly certain that if I was lost and alone somewhere like that, I wouldn't question anyone who offered help. On Christmas Eve 2010, the body of 42-year-old Lori Erica Ruff was found in a car parked outside the Ruff family home in Longview, Texas. She had ended her life with a self-inflicted gunshot to the head. Lori's husband, Blake Ruff, was devastated. In the days following her death, he began the grim task of sorting through his wife's possessions. Included among the items was a sealed lockbox buried deep in Lori's closet. The grieving husband recognized the box. In life, Lori had warned him to stay away from it. Upon opening the container, Blake discovered why. Inside was a birth certificate and IDs belonging to several different people. His wife was not who she claimed to be. She was an accomplished identity thief. Blake Ruff married the woman he had known as Lori in 2004. Her suicide came after Blake had filed for divorce and moved back in with his parents. Lori's behavior was highly erratic in the time between the separation and her death. She sent threatening emails to Blake and his family and might have even attempted a break-in at Blake's parents' home. Prior to marrying Blake, Lori was known as Lori Erica Kennedy. She arrived at this identity by way of a girl named Becky Sue Turner. Little Becky was just two years old when she died in a house fire outside of Seattle, Washington in 1971. Lori acquired Becky Turner's birth certificate in 1988. It's clear that even at this time, Lori knew what she was doing. Becky had been born in one state and died in another making it far less likely that the fraudulent use of her identity would be discovered. She then moved to Idaho and procured a driver's license using the deceased girl's birth certificate. After several months living as Becky Sue Turner, she legally changed her name to Lori Kennedy. It was under this new assumed name that she eventually moved to the Dallas area where she met and married Blake Ruff. Although Blake's family was suspicious of Lori from the beginning, Blake himself was very much in love. When asked about her background, Lori was guarded and evasive. She claimed her parents were dead and she had no siblings. Blake and Lori married in 2004. The only witness to their marriage was the priest. After marrying, the couple moved away from their senior roughs who lived in eastern Texas, settling in Leonard, Texas in the southwestern region. Lori and Blake tried to have a child almost immediately after they were married, but found themselves experiencing fertility issues. Four years filled with miscarriages and disappointments passed. Lori kept to herself, rarely speaking. Finally, in 2008, the pair had a daughter, conceived with in vitro fertilization. After the birth of their daughter, Lori's behavior became increasingly strange. She refused to let other people hold the child and was overly protective, even for a first-time mother. The tension between the Ruffs continued to grow as the new grandparents were rebuffed from visits. Lori began to complain to Blake about his parents whenever she was even mildly inconvenienced. Blake, who was close with his parents, couldn't take it anymore. 
In 2010, he moved back in with his parents and filed for divorce. Within a few months of Blake moving out, Lori had completely deteriorated. She was sending unhinged, threatening emails to the Ruffs. She and her daughter were losing weight. She even possibly tried to break into the Ruffs' home. Early on Christmas Eve, Lori drove over to the Ruff house. She parked her car, left it running, and shot herself. Some time later, Blake's father left the house to pick up the paper. He noticed the car and called the police. Lori left behind two suicide notes, one of which was addressed to her husband and the other to her young daughter. Authorities inspected both letters, which they described as ramblings from a clearly disturbed person. They contained no reference to Lori's life as an identity thief, nor a confession of her true identity. With little to no clues about who she might actually be, the woman once known as Lori Erica Ruff was registered in the federal government's database of missing and unidentified persons as a Jane Doe. Investigators then began the search for her true identity, a process that would take six years to complete. Then, in September 2016, the case of Lori Erica Ruff was finally solved. Her real name was Kimberly McLean. Using a DNA analysis from Ruff's daughter, investigators were able to trace Ruff's identity back to a family in Pennsylvania whose daughter had disappeared in 1986 when she was 17. They believed she fled because she did not like her mother's new husband. While the file on Lori Erica Ruff may be closed, her bizarre case continues to fascinate and will forever raise the chilling question, just how well do you know those closest to you? When Weird Darkness Returns, was there a plot to murder Marconi scientists in the 1980s? That story is up next. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Between 1982 and 1990, a cluster of strange and often grisly deaths among scientists and computer experts working in Britain's high-tech defense industry baffled investigators. Many of the deaths were so bizarre they left coroners unable to determine their cause. Others were judged to be suicides and accidents, despite clear evidence to the contrary. Most of the victims were computer scientists working for Marconi Electronic Systems and related companies on top-secret defense projects, including the U.S. Strategic Defense Initiative. Due to the nature of their work and the oddness of their deaths, by 1987 the national and international press had latched on to the story. Were the deaths sabotage by a foreign government or some kind of Cold War plot? 
Tony Collins, a correspondent for the UK's Computer Weekly, started to receive reports of deaths amongst computer scientists and engineers in the mid-80s. Over the next few years, he would file a series of stories on the deaths, eventually finding 25 cases he felt were connected. In 1990, he wrote a book, Open Verdict, which concluded the spate of deaths were suspicious. Collins suspected some kind of plot but was unable to come up with any firm conclusions as to its true nature. Was there really a plot to murder the scientists? The story began in March 1982 with the death of senior computer scientist Dr. Keith Bowden, then a contractor for GEC Marconi, Britain's major high-tech defense company. One night after attending a social function in London, Bowden drove his car across a dual carriageway and plunged off a bridge down an embankment and into an abandoned rail yard. He died instantly. The police said Bowden was drunk and was driving too fast, but his wife and solicitor believed otherwise. Friends who were with Bowden that night denied he'd been drinking. Bowden's solicitor hired an accident investigator to examine the wreck. Somebody had swapped the normally pristine tires on Bowden's rover with a set that were worn and old. Three years later, radar designer Roger Hill killed himself with a shotgun in his home. Later that year, Jonathan Wash died after plunging from a hotel window. The coroner returned an open verdict. More puzzling still was the death of Vimal Dajibe, 24, who jumped off the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol in August 1986. Dajibe had been working at Marconi on computer control systems for Stingray torpedoes. Another open verdict was returned. Dajibe was found with his pants around his ankles and a needle-sized puncture wound on his buttock. The Bristol coroner was concerned by this. It was a mystery then and remains a mystery now. Perhaps the most disturbing of all the deaths occurred two months later. Arshad Sharif, 26, another computer scientist who worked on satellite guidance systems at Marconi, died in the oddest circumstances imaginable. Sharif also traveled to Bristol, tied one end of a ligature to his neck, the other end to a tree, then jammed his foot on the accelerator of his car and decapitated himself. The day before his death, Sharif had been acting oddly and was seen paying for accommodations in a rooming house with a bundle of high-denomination banknotes. A relative summoned to identify the body noticed something suspicious about his car. What appeared to be a metal rod was lying on the floor of the car next to the accelerator. Had it been used to wedge down the pedal? The coroner wasn't happy. This is past coincidence. I will not be completing this inquest until I know how two men with no connection to Bristol came to meet the same end here. He never did find out why, but both men were suspected to be working on a top-secret project called Cosmos, which involved underwater guidance systems, establishing a further connection between the pair. Thousands of people worked in the UK's defense industry in the mid-80s, and these deaths, spread out over three years, could easily be dismissed as coincidences. Indeed, nobody at the time made any connection. But moving into 1987 and 1988, the pace of deaths massively increased, and the UK press and some MPs began to join the dots. 1987 started with the death of Richard Pugh, another computer expert in the defense industry and consultant to the MOD. Pugh's body was found in his flat, his feet bound, a plastic bag on his head, and a thick rope coiled around his body the coroner's verdict was an accident due to sexual misadventure. Just days later, another scientist engaged in top-secret work for the MOD, Dr. John Britton, died in his own garage of carbon monoxide poisoning. The next month, another Marconi engineer, David Skeels, also died of carbon monoxide poisoning, found in his car with a hose pipe connected to the exhaust. Also in February, two more defense engineers and scientists died, Victor Moore from an overdose and Peter People, yet another victim of carbon monoxide poisoning. People's death was particularly troubling. Having spent an evening with friends, he and his wife returned home 
and people went to put away the car. The next morning, his wife found his body jammed underneath the car with his mouth next to the exhaust pipe. Police were unconvinced it was suicide because it seemed impossible he could have maneuvered his body into the odd position it was found. An open verdict was ultimately returned. John Whiteman supposedly drowned himself in his bathtub, the body surrounded by pills and empty alcohol bottles, yet the autopsy revealed no trace of drugs or alcohol in his body. In March, David Sands, a senior scientist working on computer-controlled radar at a Marconi sister company, made a sudden U-turn in his car and crashed at high speed into an empty cafe. His vehicle was inexplicably loaded up with cans of petrol, causing the car to be completely consumed by a fireball. Sands was only identified with reference to his dental records. In April, in almost identical fashion to Richard Pugh at the start of 1987, Mark Weisner, 24, was found dead with a plastic bag on his head and cling film wrapped around his face. The verdict was death by sexual misadventure. The previous year, Marconi purchased defense electronics firm Plessy. Within a month, between May and June 1987, two of its scientists were dead, Michael Baker, 22, in May, and Frank Jennings, 60, in June. At the start of 1988, lab technician Russell Smith, 23, jumped off a cliff in Cornwall. A senior computer engineer at Marconi, Trevor Knight, was the victim of yet another suicide by car exhaust pipe. In August, there were two gruesome electrocutions of senior figures at Marconi that are some of the most suspicious of all the deaths. Alistair Beckham, 50, was a computer engineer who it's believed was working on top-secret pilot programs for America's Strategic Defense Initiative. After some light Sunday afternoon gardening, Beckham retired to his shed, attached wires to his chest, pushed them into a power socket, and, with a handkerchief jammed in his mouth, hit the power. Beckham's wife was entirely unconvinced her husband committed suicide. Beckham was highly secretive about his work, and just hours after his death, men from the Ministry of Defense arrived at the scene and took away several documents and files from Beckham's home. In similar but even more gruesome fashion, Marconi director John Ferry, 60, jammed stripped wires into his tooth fillings and electrocuted himself. Could all of these grisly suicides really just be a coincidence? By now, several stories in the press had appeared questioning whether there was actually some kind of KGB or Eastern Bloc conspiracy to kill the scientists. Several MPs and trade union leader Clive Jenkins called for an inquiry into the deaths. Jenkins wrote that the deaths were statistically incredible and spoke of the concern amongst his members over these clusters of suicides, violent deaths, or murders. The conservative government of Margaret Thatcher dismissed calls for an inquiry, claiming the deaths were not statistically unusual and were just coincidences, perhaps exacerbated by high levels of stress in the defense industry. Professor Colin Pritchard, a noted expert in mental illness and suicides, thinks at least some of the deaths were statistically uncommon. While it's true, suicide is one of the most prevalent causes of early death in men, especially young men, Pritchard believes factors in some of the cases make the suicide verdicts unlikely. Pritchard cites the cases of at least four of the men that share unusual elements. All four men had complained to friends and family that they had been tasked strange, impossible, and unscientific tasks by their employers. All four men committed suicide in incredibly violent and bizarre ways. Pritchard had studied numerous suicide cases and thinks such extreme suicide methods are normally only associated with people suffering severe mental breakdowns, to the extent they would be unable to even hold down jobs. Yet the men were all employed up until the day of their deaths, and none had shown any sign of mental illness or other disturbance. All of the men had also recently found new jobs and were preparing to leave within days of their deaths. Likewise, all four men had recently arranged appointments with their MPs. What were the strange, unscientific projects that the men were complaining of, and why had they all booked appointments with their MPs? 
Had they stumbled on something in their jobs that had worried them? Something that led to them being silenced? Several of the deaths were put down to sex games gone wrong, but intelligence expert Conrad Black says death by sexual misadventure is a common method of disguising murder in the world of espionage. Black told the Daily Record, disposing of an enemy and making it look like a perverted fantasy gone wrong is in the training manuals of every spy agency from MI6 to Mossad. The sex game cover is a very useful mechanism in a murder. Not only does it provide a disguise for the actual means and method of death, it trashes the reputation of the victim and blunts the energy of any subsequent investigation. The Marconi deaths weren't the only unexplained, violent, or unusual deaths among defense workers in Europe in the 1980s. In West Germany in 1986, there were several incidents involving individuals associated with America's SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative dubbed Star Wars by the press. The Strategic Defense Initiative was an ambitious program to create a space-based anti-nuclear weapon shield which would have rendered Soviet nuclear capability useless. In July, Carl Heinz Beckerts, a director at Siemens and an SDI contractor, was killed by a car bomb in Munich. Later in 86, Gerald von Bruenmuehl, a senior advisor in SDI negotiations, was killed. There were other attacks on firms related to SDI, and German prosecutors believed they were being targeted. Similar deaths and disappearances amongst defense figures in Sweden and Italy occurred at the same time, giving rise to the suspicion that there was an Eastern Bloc plot to attack Western defense capability and the SDI. Attempting to undermine an enemy's defense capabilities by murdering their scientists is not uncommon. The US, UK, and Israel have all been known to strategically stage accidents to remove high-ranking enemy scientists for political ends. In recent years, at least four top Iranian nuclear scientists have been killed by Israel's Mossad in an attempt to derail Iran's nuclear program. Killing targets in a foreign country is also not uncommon. In 1978, dissident Georgi Markov was murdered on Waterloo Bridge in London by agents of the Bulgarian secret police aided by the KGB. Many of the Marconi scientists were involved either directly or peripherally in the Star Wars program and other related projects. Could their strange deaths actually have been a series of Russian or East German orchestrated murders designed to scuttle the SDI? The British government, Marconi, and many in the press blamed stress in the high-pressure defense industry for the cluster of suicides. Stress has often been cited as a problem in the secret defense industry and may have been a contributing factor to the cluster of suicides. Suicide is the most common form of death in men ages 20 to 49, the age bracket into which almost all of the Marconi scientists fell into. It would therefore not be unexpected to find a fair number of suicides in a male-dominated occupation, especially one that operates under such tight secrecy. Some of the widows commented on how their husbands were unable to talk about their secret work, if they were having trouble with the jobs, the fact that they may have been unable to discuss the situation with their loved ones may have been another contributing factor. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Vampire in New Orleans was written by Brent Swanser. A Supernatural Disappearance in Yosemite is by Beth Elias. The Woman Without an Identity was written by Stephanie Weber. And The Marconi Murders was posted at The Unredacted. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Matthew 9, verse 13. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And a final thought. Contentment is, after all, simply refined indolence. Thomas Chandler Halliburton. I'm Darren Marlar.
Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.